Welcome to the Startup Grind. speaking to our headline, uh, Michael Teraspolsky. Now, Michael, we don't know where you're from. We're going to ask you these questions today, that crazy surname. But what we are going to be finding out is about franchising, how to start a business. Um, we've been in business for 20 years. They also were nominated as one of the best, this is quite a mouthful, best Italian franchise in the People's Choice Best of Johannesburg Awards in 2011 and 2012. I think that's pretty impressive. And I love this one. Gold Award for Wine List at the Diners Club International. Because guess where the wine must come from? Cape Town, I'm pretty sure. So this, for that was for 2009, 10, 11, and 12. And they also won Franchise Store of the Year Award in 2013. So these guys are really making headlines, and they make amazing pizza. So, Michael, can you all stand up? Give a massive round of applause for Michael Teraspolsky. Woo! Welcome, welcome. I'll sit. Stage. Right, I'm going to pour myself some water here. There we go. <sighs> welcome to Start of Ground. Good evening. Howdy. Now, we start all startup grinds by first of all asking where are you from? Where were you born, raised, and where were your parents from that gave you that interesting surname? So, I was born in Johannesburg, and uh, so was my dad. Right, you're local, yes. My grandfather, on my father's side, came from Lithuania. Oh. And uh, my mother's English. Okay, so you've got quite a, so the surname comes from the grandfather. From so the Lithuania, Poland, borders okay. over the years must have been. Okay, excellent. So and you grew up in Joburg. Where did, you, where did you study or what did you do as a kid? Um, misbehaved a lot. I think I still do. <laughs> um, I, I grew up, I went to a, a Jewish day school. King yeah. David, and at the end of Standard 5, they don't do Standard 5 anymore, Grade 7, um, my father felt I needed discipline, so he sent me to St. Stithians, which is an all-boys oh. Christian school, Yes. Um, and they instilled discipline in me, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> they think. Okay, so um, tell us, in a nutshell, because we have got an international audience, what is Kokakia? Am I saying it right? Is it Kokakia yes, or Kokakia? Kokakia. Kokakia. Okay. Yeah. What is it in a nutshell? 60 seconds. It is the best of breed gourmet pizza restaurant in South Africa. And we specialize in pizza. Obviously, salad and pasta and dessert. Okay. Thank you. Now, we're going to tell, tell us about why did you get into the, brand, into the pizza business? Tell us a startup story of so I used to go and eat at a restaurant in Johannesburg called Cornuti, some of you may know it, in Elova, and there was a young lady there that used to work there, mates of mine used to own the restaurant, and she used to manage and run the, sto the store. And it was a great concept. They just did pizza and, and salads, and it was really, really good. And my mates used to come in once a week to collect the cash, and this young girl used to work like a dog. Um, and I was a regular customer, I loved it, and I befriended her and we became very, very friendly, and I'd never worked in a restaurant a day in my life, and I woke up one morning, I had this epiphany that I wanted to be in the restaurant industry, it was literally, it was like, that's what I want to do. I was a late starter, I was like 28 years old when this happened, I misbehaved up until then, and I decided, I, I just woke up one morning, I knew this is what I want to do, I'm going to be really good at it, it's going to be fantastic. And I approached her and I said to her, why don't we go down to Cape Town and open a restaurant similar to this? And she said, you've never worked in a restaurant before. I said, I know. I said, but I'm entrepreneurial. I said, I know about business and you know about food. Let's go and do this. And she was 19 at the time. Um, 
and she said, let me think about it. She went away and she, she came back and, I don't know, a few weeks later and we were mulling this over. Eventually she said yes and we were working out all the logistics and I, I came down to Cape Town looking for a site and we were, I was looking all around Cape Town and I don't know how many of you are from Cape Town or if you're as old as I am. Uh, the, f the original restaurant called Kaki Pizzeria is on the foreshore. That building is over 100 years old. It's from 1890, somewhere around there. It was the only building on that block. There was no Investec, there was no Holiday Inn, there was nothing. And the agent from Seif, who had offices upstairs, was showing me all around Cape Town. I said, but what about this building where your offices are? And he looked at me like I was mad. And uh, he said, well, we have a, a, an empty store here. So I said, great, let me see it. Looked at the five meter ceilings, I said, we'll take it. He thought we were mad. And I went in there and signed my lease and got plans. Did you see a vision for this area or what was it? I just saw this beautiful building with Brookie Lace, this character building. I thought, who would not want to come and eat in an awesome restaurant in this space? Even though there was nothing around, did you, did you worry about foot traffic at the time? Or? Not at all. In fact, I didn't once ever, it didn't occur to me once, what if I fail? I just, uh, it never crossed my mind, which is quite fortunate because I never thought, well, this is the last penny I've got. <laughs> if it doesn't work, what am I going to do after that? I just always knew there it There was no plan B? No, because plan A was always going to work. Okay, I like that. And did, did you know this because of your entrepreneurial experience up until the age of 28? I just knew it. I can't even explain it because I haven't had that same feeling when I opened the second store or the third store when I knew they were going to be good and I had experience in the game. But I just knew this was going to work. I thought the product is amazing. People are going to love it. There's nothing like this in Cape Town. How can it not work? And it's a beautiful building. Why will people not come here? And that's the same, the same store that's still running there. The one that's still there today. 22 yeah. years later, 23 years yeah. later. That's incredible. And so you signed the leases. How did you fund the business? What, what did you, where did that come from? So I took money that I had that I'd earned and I'd, I'd put aside. Uh, my partner at the time, her name's Kinga, she, uh, she had to borrow some money. Her parents couldn't afford to send her to university, so she started working as a waitress the day she finished school. Her parents were immigrants from Poland. She was born in Poland. And she had to start earning cash the day she finished school. That, hence, she started waitressing and I met her in the restaurant. And she borrowed some money. Um, and we came down, well, I came down to build the restaurant, um, and literally we, we built it. I didn't, I didn't have an, money for an architect, so I got graph paper and I drew the plans, and I went to council and I said, these are my plans for my restaurant. The guy said, they need to be to scale. I said, they are to scale. <laughs> he said, there needs to be three copies. I said, there are three copies. He said, you can't give me plans like this. It was like, There's no architect's name at the bottom. It wasn't like that. It was like a green graph paper. So he said, well, you have to have colors. He said, you've got to have like red for electricity and like blue for water and green for gas. So I, I said, you've got some colored pencils? He said, yes. I'm, <laughs> I put it in. I said, is there anything wrong with these plans? He said, they're a bit unorthodox. He said, but there's nothing wrong with them. I said, what do I do now? He said, you, you've got to walk them through council and you've got to get a stamp from the electrical engineering and the water department, the fire department. So I walked around for two hours. I came back, I had every stamp on my plans that was required. Never, ever got plans to council that fast in any other restaurant I've ever built. Not even close. Normally, it's weeks to months. <laughs> weeks. And this was two hours from start to finish with my hand-drawn plans. Um, and then we opened the restaurant on her 21st birthday, my partner's 21st birthday. Wow. Yeah. She was in the kitchen. I was in the front. That's how. And you're manning. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we started. Did, did she come down just before you opened up? Did she you came, came, down she came a month before. I came earlier to build the store and help get in. And... I mean, we did, they didn't deliver our chairs the day before we opened. <laughs> Literally the day before, the company who I'd paid a lot of money to said, we can't deliver. And I had to run around. Eventually, I found a hiring place, and they gave us these disgusting, horrible chairs. And the day we opened our showpiece restaurant, we had these horrible chairs. I wanted to kill the guy from that company. <laughs> I won't tell you which company it is. We actually still use them. I just don't talk to the guy. <laughs> <laughs> 22 years later. <laughs> Big grudge. <Yeah. laughs> um... So we had horrible chairs for about two weeks until they could bring out other chairs. Oh, other chairs. Yeah. And did you find people coming? Did you pull in your friends? You know, most entrepreneurs, they start off with their friends, family, and fools. Was this the same So place? we moved down from Joburg. I knew about five people, okay. and King knew no one. <laughs> um, so we got in there, and the first lunch was okay. And it was a small, it was a 60-seater restaurant, and 
She was in the kitchen with a couple of kitchen staff, and I was in the front cooking pizzas and cutting them and taking them to the tables. And that night, all the people from Seif in the building upstairs brought everyone they knew, and the five friends I had brought everyone they knew, and we were slammed, and I just burnt all the food. <laughs> I li- no, literally, I burnt all the food. You couldn't eat it. I couldn't serve. I couldn't, sit, I couldn't charge them for the food. I gave them free food. I gave everyone free food, and they just thought, this, this poor guy. <laughs> this poor guy and this girl, they're going to be back in Joburg without their shirts so soon. Um, but I learned quickly not to burn the food, and the second day was better. But it was only the first day I ever worked in a restaurant, so I was well, oh, that's pretty impressive. Forgiven. Well yeah. done. So you're a quick learner. Yeah. It makes a difference. Okay. So tell us, what was the tipping point that you went from one store to two stores? So the original store took off well. It really did. It took off straight away. People loved the food the way I anticipated it. And it became very popular. And it was like everybody's little secret. They knew about this little Italian place down on the foreshore where there was you know, this building that no one ever thought there was anything in other than Seif. And it took off nicely. started doing well, made good money. And then 1995, we decided to open a second store. And we opened up Morituri in Claremont on the main road. It's still there today. We don't own it, though. Um, and that was in August 95. In January 96, we opened a third store. It was in Morituri in Tiger Valley. Okay. I was running between the two stores. And, and King Did you open it under a different name for a specific you, reason? Yeah, you see, because Kolkaka is like a terrible name. You can't say it. You can't pronounce it correctly. You can't spell it. When you phone direct inquiries and say, I'm looking for a telephone number for Kolkaki Pizzeria, they can't spell it, so they say the place doesn't exist. It's a shocking name. <laughs> so we called it Morituri instead, which is another shocking name. <laughs> <laughs> so Africans don't like Italian names. No, no, they, they was, and Morituri is not even Italian. It's like the Latins, those oh. who are about to die. I mean, who calls a restaurant that? <laughs> no, it's terrible. We thought it was like to die for, you know, like foods to die for. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> it was better than Kolkaki, maybe than Mimi, I'm not sure. Okay. So you opened up those two stores, um, and you sold, you sold off that entire... So, yeah. So then in uh, 99, one of my customers in Tiger Valley wanted to buy my store, and I was running between the two, so I said, that suits me fine. <laughs> and then in... So it wasn't uh, part of some great business plan? No, no, no. We, we had the three. What happened was my business partner, Kinga, wasn't happy with 50% of the business. Um, so she married me <laughs> to get control. Um, Wise woman. <laughs> and she is, she's smart. <laughs> but I sleep with the boss, so that's okay. Um, um, so we, we got married in 1998, and uh, I was sitting in my restaurant in Claremont, and my, we got married in December the 22nd, and it must have been about January the 15th, end of January. And I don't even know if I had a cell phone in those days. It might have been a bit too soon for me. I was a late adopter. I saw my wife walking down the road, walking towards it, and she just started crying. I'm like, what's wrong, what's wrong? She said, I'm pregnant. I said, what, we've only got married like four weeks ago. She said, I know. My daughter was born nine months and three days after the wedding. The maths is quite tight. <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> we, were, we were working, and uh, it was a Friday night. And my wife called me. I was in the Claremont store at Moratorium. My wife was in, in the Cape Town store. And she said to me, I think I'm in labor. I said, well, what do you mean you're in labor? You're either in labor or you're not in labor. She said, well, I've got pains and they're coming and going. So I said, well, are you sure? She said, I'll ask the barman to time this. <laughs> so she called me about two hours later. She said, no, the barman's been timed. It's definitely labor. So <laughs> I left and I ran. I got her and we, we went and we, we rushed off to the hospital and had a baby that night. And, and that. It was round about then that uh, the customer approached me and said, listen, I want to buy the store in, um, in, in Tiger Valley. So I thought, you know, with a wife and a baby now and three restaurants, maybe it's not a bad idea if I scale down to two. Um, so we sold that restaurant. And, okay. uh, just the one? Just the you one. two Maraturis? Yeah. So you sold just the one, you yeah. kept the other one, okay. And uh, I was running between town and Claremont. And then in 2001, one of my customers approached me again and said he wanted to buy the Claremont store. And everybody always used to say to us, when are you going to franchise? When are you going to bring Kolkakia to Joburg? When are you bringing it to Durban? When are you going to come here and there? And it's bloody expensive to open a restaurant. I don't know if any of you have ever opened a restaurant or an eatery. Everyone thinks, well, it's, you know, it's not that Chairs bad. and tables, right? No, it's chairs and tables, you know. It's damn expensive. It's very capital intensive. Um, 
and to keep opening your own store requires a lot of cash. So I said to Kinga, my wife, I said to her, listen, if, if this deal goes through and we get down to one store, then the only way we can expand again is either to open more stores or to franchise, and I'd like to franchise. She was terrified. She didn't want to do it. She couldn't get her head around franchising. She thought it was, you know, this was a bad idea, and she wasn't comfortable, and she's not a corporate type. Was she worried about quality? Was she worried about... She was just disability? worried. Just, she was just this big thing. She saw franchises with lots of restaurants, and she was just a waitress. And I was like a waiter. What did we know from franchising? So I said to her, well, I didn't know anything about restaurants when I started working, so why should it be any different with this? So <laughs> um, a good friend of mine's a director at Ocean Basket. So I called him up. I said, Pedro, I said, you've got to come and talk to Kinga. I said, she's terrified. I said, this is a logical step. We should go franchising. So he sat down with her and he said, like, what are your fears? She said, I'm scared of this. And what about that? And what about this? And what if I don't? And he said, don't worry about it. He said, you'll be fine. And this, this, this. And he, he was probably the one that put her most at ease. You know, your wife never listens to you, but she'll listen to somebody else. Well, that's <laughs> in my, my house. <laughs> so um, that's when we, so we sold it. And that's when we decided we'd start franchising the business. So yeah. And you saw that as a way to scale and get the business bigger and still To build the brand, yeah. To build the brand. brand, scale it up, get a lot of stores out there and, and take our great product to you know, to the world or to South Africa. So if I'm now an entrepreneur, I haven't got a lot of money, but I've got a bit of money and I wanted to go into the franchising business. What are the processes that I've got to go through to join your um, brand? So you're saying... You got money and you want to buy a franchise, or you got a business and you want to start franchising it? No, I want to get into the franchising business, into your brand. Okay. And then we'll come to the second question. Okay, so we have changed our application criteria quite significantly since we first started. In the beginning, we'd have an interview. You're quite a nice guy. You seem quite friendly. Well, therefore, and you got cash. Let's sign you up. Now it's a very, very different story, and we almost talk you out of it. No, it's, it's, it's true because having a, a, a person, in a franchisee who should never be a franchisee becomes a big problem. It's that 80-20 year old. You spend 80% of the time with people who are bringing you 20% of your income or less. Um, they're locked into a contract. They're locked into leases. It becomes a big problem. So our process is you make an inquiry and then we send you the franchise application pack, which is with an application form in there and some information about the brand and the kind of money it's going to cost you. And it's, it's amazing. A new store, all in, including VAT, all in is about 4 million rand. We say you need 50% unencumbered funds. Unencumbered. You can't owe any money on this. You've got to have the cash. So it's 2 million bucks. It's a lot of money. You'll get somebody who comes in and he gives you his balance sheet and he's got like 50,000 rand on there. But he thinks maybe we'll just let him be a franchisee. I don't know. It's strange. <laughs> but um, So we get the application form back. We vet it, we do the credit checks, we do everything. Then we send you off to a company called Omnicore to go and do psychometric role fit assessment, which I've never done because I'd probably fail it. <laughs> so I just, I don't do it. I refuse to do it. And, we, and it's quite an intensive thing. It takes about four or five hours and then they do role play and then they send us the results. Then we put them through a practical assessment, which is in one of our stores for three days, open till close, and we give them the shittest work we can give them. <laughs> Cut onions. <laughs> get in the freezer room, count stock for like half an hour until it comes out like this. Um, and we give them just like a lot of stuff. We give them some nice things to do, but we put them all around the restaurant and they're on their feet from nine in the morning till like two in the morning. And we just want to see whether they quit, whether they're paying attention, whether they embrace it, whether they're sitting on their cell phones all day. Get through that. It's all scored and graded. And then there's a panel interview which they go through and then finally their reference checks that we, we check and everything's scored and weighted and then if you hit a certain score mark uh, you'll be accepted as a franchisee okay do you have like um, I know like a um, franchise warehouse and other institutions that actually help entrepreneurs get funding do you take part in any of those things like help the entrepreneurs if you see this guy's actually got the talent he hasn't got the money but he could actually become a franchisee do you assist them in that way or so we don't offer funding at all, but we will help, um, we'll help the process. So we'll speak to guys like franchising, uh, Franchise Warehouse, we'll speak to the banks. Um, banks are the worst people in the world. Any bankers here? 
Hate bankers. <laughs> Two bankers. Hate bankers. <laughs> hate bankers. Never give you money. Won't give you an umbrella when it's raining, but they'll give you one when the sun's beating down. <laughs> but um, we do work with the banks. Um, but borrowing money is hard, and it's not just the banks. It's hard to get funding these days. It's not like the old days, um, which is why we insist on 50% unencumbered. In the old days, you put on 10% when you first took a franchise and, and, and fund 90% because you could get 90% funding. No bank will give you 90% funding now. Um, they'll, they'll, you'll battle to get 50% funding from them. But we are developing some good relationships with some of the banks and we're trying to get them, and I think a lot of the people in, in franchising are trying to get them to look at franchising through slightly different eyes. Um, and I'm a big believer that small and medium businesses is, is the future of job creation in this country. Um, and I think the banks need to sort of look at the whole picture holistically and maybe have a little bit of a different sort of outlook on, on, on how. Now, coming back to the second question, if I was to franchise my business, what advice would you have for me? So Obviously, it's a very broad question, but... Okay, so I'll tell you what happened with me. So when I said I wanted to go franchising, I knew nothing about franchising. Um, so the first thing I did was starting to go to my mentors, people that I bounced stuff off. And I've got one friend in particular who's a CEO of a, a listed company, and a bright guy, and a guy that I really like, and, he's, and he always shoots from the hip. And I told him what I wanted to do, and he said to me, Michael, he said, you do know that you're going into an industry where the number one guy in the industry probably owns 60% of the market, the number two guy, 25% of the market, number three guys probably got 10% of the market, and everybody else is finding it out for the scraps, and you want to enter that market, and you think you can play. He said, how are you going to play? So I thought about it. I said, I'm going to be the number one guy in the gourmet pizza market. So whilst it's a small section, I was going to be number one there and I, and I think that we've done a very good job of of trying to do that and I think we are that um, so I knew where I wanted to be and I think if you are going to franchise your business you need to know where you're going to play in the market uh, next thing we did was we found a franchise consultant and they're all based in Joburg sadly and we spoke to them and we said this is what we do and this is our model do you think it's franchisable and they came back and they said yes um, and they loved it, and then very soon I found out whilst we were talking with them, they were very beneficial, that they wanted to get a piece of the action early on. Um, so keep your eyes open when you're dealing with, uh, with these guys. If they see a gap when you know nothing and they know, know everything, uh, you'll be very quick to want to give away some of your business so you can have some of their, their knowledge, um, and I saw that early on. But they were great. They told me what I needed to do, developing ops and procedures manuals and getting my, my business systemized so that it could be replicated by franchisees. Before we started franchising, I never knew what a pizza cost me. If you said to me, what does a margarita cost to make? I couldn't tell you. So how much does it cost? I'm not sure. <laughs> but, I can, but I can look it up <laughs> on my system now. It's there. Um, we never did a stock take, ever. Never did a stock take. Never did a stock take. We, and our business was profitable from day two. <laughs> Not first night, yes. day two. Was <laughs> the first month, we broke even. We traded for three weeks. From then onward, we never had a month that didn't make profit. Wow. But we, ran, we were so close to the coal face of our business that if something was out of kilter, we knew. We, we were just on knew. the ground running. We were on the ground. I mean, I'll never forget. There was a day we were sitting. I was in the front of, of house, the counter in the restaurant, and I was talking to Kinga. And I was in mid-sentence, and she just turned around, and she ran into the kitchen. She just ran away. And I went in there, and I said, what's this? She opened the dustbin, and she pulled out a can of cold drink that was full. I said, what are you doing? She said, who took this cold drink? So I called staff, and like, they like this. She said, you're going to tell me you took it? And eventually somebody put up their hand. Why are you stealing my cold drink? Whatever the story was. I said to her, how did you know? She said, I heard that can click. And that, when I mean that's how close we were to our business, <laughs> you just knew what was happening. You knew straight away if you were ordering more stock than you would normally order, something wasn't right. <laughs> now, we take stock take every week. We count stock at night. We do, I mean, there's so many systems in place, but you have to have it because every franchisee is not going to be like you. And you've got to be able to give them the tools to be like you so they can run the business that they saw when they came to you and wanted a franchise. 
when I, when I um, contacted you and we were like discussing and planning for this, I was like, Kokachi, Kokakio, we make pizzas. We're going to try them out. So my wife and I were going around to all your different stores trying out Kokakio pizzas and they had the nice banting um, pizzas. Well, that was great. And one of the things I wanted to know, because at every store we went to, the standard was very much the same. How do you ensure that you keep that standard across the, um, all your franchises? So that's probably the hardest thing about franchising. Um, and with any business, but particularly in the food business, um, it's all about consistency and not just franchising, any business about consistency. If you walk into one store and you buy something or you eat something and you walk into another store when it should be the same and it's not, there's disappointment or elation. Both are no good. If the other store's better than the first store, then there's a problem with the first store. If the other store's worse, well, then the brand's going down you know, down the drain. And this is very, very difficult. And customers, what we found with our customers, most of our customers are regulars. And how many of you eat at my stores? Let's show of hands. How many of you have the same thing every time you come into my store? Show of hands. Okay, so you can see most of my customers are regulars. Most of them have the same thing every time they come into the store. And they think they're going to have something different. You give them the menu, they'll spend hours on the menu and then order the same thing they always have. <laughs> But because they go to multiple stores to eat, they know what that dish tastes like and they have an expectation before they walk in the store. And most of my customers know on Monday, if they're coming on Saturday night, they know on Monday what they're going to have to eat. And when they walk into that store and they get their pizza, their morituri or whatever the pizza is, whatever that dish is, and it's not the way they know it should be, there's disappointment. And the problem with my restaurant, with, with my business and my industry is that it's the money that people spend after they've paid for the bond, the house, the insurance, the kids' school fees, like everything. They work their, you know, their hands to the bone and their fingers to the bone, and they come with that little bit that they've got left over to spoil themselves, and then they walk into a restaurant, and then they have a shit experience, and they get so pissed off. <laughs> and you'll see tweets. You'll see, you cannot believe how pissed off people will get for 100 bucks. They, you know, the... <laughs> the mechanic can drop their car off the lift. They won't be as upset as they will be. And it's because, it, but I don't blame them. It's that money that they've worked so hard for that they want to spoil themselves for. And maybe you can do that once a month. And then some guys just mucked it up. So that consistency thing is huge. So we sit there and we make a, a huge effort. So obviously there's training when you, you know, new franchisees go through training, staff go through training. And we have operational staff in our stores every single week. We have mystery diners that go into the stores every month. And we're in there and we're checking all the time. We go through and we check everything and we make sure it's right. Uh, staff go on training sessions. We've just implemented, and I'm so proud to say this, first restaurant in the country. We're doing this online training, which we've developed through a company called Fuel. Um, on an iPad, all our stores, you go in there and there's training videos. You go and you put in your headphones, it's about five minutes long. You've got to answer questions before you can go on to the next module. And we've shot all the videos and we're in the process of shooting more and building up this library. But so there can be consistent training in all the stores. Because I don't know if any of you have been on a training course or you send your staff on training courses. The trainer can have a good day and they can have a bad day. Depending who your trainer is, you don't know how good the training is going to be. Um, so now we get this really consistent training. And you know, to sit through a half-day talk and try and remember what the person said is really difficult. Have a five-minute video get tested on it straight away, and you can send the person back to do that video whenever you want. You, know, you see them on the floor and they're not doing a great job, you say, hey, Joe, you know, go back and do, you know, wait till 101 again. Um, so, yeah, that's one so of the So you're ways. basically saying, trust your stores, but validate everything. Like You've that. got to. You've got to do the training all the time. And then the other thing is, is educating our staff that it's got to be consistent. So if you walk into any of our stores, everything is portioned, everything is measured. You will not get a different product at another store. And if you do, then it's generally can a one-off. You tweet about it. No, you, can, you will tweet about it. Your Instagram, you'll take a photo, you'll send it up there, you'll get hold of Hello Peter, who I hate, by the way, because he makes us pay money. He holds us to ransom. He says, someone said something bad about you. Do you want to respond? Yes, I'd love to respond. Well, then you have to pay us, and we'll give you the chance to respond. Oh, so I, business model? I have now taken the bold step this year. I've been trying to get it past my fellow directors for a while. We will not respond to any more Hello Peters. 
I refuse to pay somebody money to be held ransom to respond to a Well, complaint. he's left the, the business now. Maybe somebody else is running. Someone else has got that same business that. model. It's blackmail. <laughs> I won't be part of it. <laughs> okay, how do you keep above? I mean, you said that you want to become the number one brand in that sector. How did you keep ahead of the brand? How, do you, how did you get to the top and how do you keep above in front of those brands? Well, so from day one, we just we were absolutely passionate about food and the kind of food that we were making. And we just made the best possible food we could. And I knew already from Kinga and her restaurant in Joburg and, and the kind of idea that we wanted to do was a similar concept and we grew it. Um, I knew the quality and I knew what we were capable of. Kinga's a self-taught chef. She's phenomenal. And the thing with us is that we, we just always maintain our quality. So, I mean, I'll give you an example. I don't know how many of you have avocado on your pizza. And it's our biggest selling topping, avocado. avocado. I remember doing an exercise a few years ago at my store in, on the foreshore. Um, I think we spent 30,000 Rand on avocados in the month of February. It was about six years ago. 30,000 <laughs> For avocados. Anyway, so avocados, what happens with avocados is they're very seasonal. So in like January, February, you go to Woolworths, an avocado can cost you 30 bucks for an avo. You go to other restaurants, you'll see avo, and it'll be SQ. Okay? And if they've got it, or the price are down like the middle of the year, with us, there's always ever, and the price is always the same. And I've run out of ever, and I've driven from town to the end of Sea Point and bought every single ever at every Woolworths from one end to the other. Bought them all. People are like, why have you got all the evers? I said, because I want them, they're mine. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have them. Mine, it's mine. <laughs> and I take them back to my restaurant, <laughs> and I've got ever for my customers because it is about maintaining that quality. And I won't like not have ever because evers have gone expensive. I've got evers. So we've always been like that with everything that we do. So we, we try and get the best quality that we can. Um, we don't use any additives. We don't use preservatives. We don't use MSG. We don't use colorants. We don't do everything is made fresh, and it's made fresh to order. Everything in our stores is made bespoke every single day, mostly. Um, there's no central kitchen, so we don't buy stuff in. There's no preservatives. Do you have a central distribution point that goes out to all them, or how do each store get there to keep that consistency? So we we have approved suppliers, okay. and they have to buy from those suppliers. So if you have a product that you can get at multiple suppliers, they don't have to buy from our supplier if they want to buy from another one, but we educate our franchisees that if we buy from the one supplier and uh, the economies of scale, we will get a better price if we all stick together and buy from that. And they work with us, our franchisees. So we do, we get the better price. And, uh, and your innovation, uh, when we went there last time, I actually got a little tic-tac afterwards instead of a suite. And I thought it was quite cool, a little tic-tac thing. It was a miniature. I don't know where you get that. But the tic-tac place. Yeah, a little tic <laughs> Not the tic-tac place. So what is it that you um, do to keep that, that those different things, those different elements in your stores? You know, we've, we've, we've never wanted to... We've never followed other people, and we've always tried to be innovative. Now, obviously, a lot of the product that we make and and uh, that we sell, you can buy very similar products. Sometimes I'm saying you can buy margarita at any pizza place. Um, but we, we always look at to see what's, you know, what do people want, what's happening in the world today. Uh, different dieting trends, different foods that are superfoods that are out there that are happening. Um, King and Henry goes overseas once every year, sometimes once every, you know, once but once a year. And she goes to check out what's happening in New York, what's happening in Italy, what's happening in London. And she'll go and she'll see and come back and say, right, you know, we, let's try this, let's try that. Interestingly, though, we very rarely find that they're doing stuff overseas that we're not doing here. And I'm not just talking about my store. I'm talking about restaurants in Cape Town. Really? Restaurants in Cape Town are, like, up there. They are so good. Wow. They exciting. really are good. And the standard is so high and it's good. Do you find with the, um, how's the banting pizza doing? Flying. We had Tim Noakes come and talk at our, our franchise conference a few years ago before he'd written his book. And uh, he came in there and he said, I'm not quite sure why you invited me to speak here today because I do not eat carbs and I tell everybody to not eat carbs and you guys sell pizza and pasta. And he told me that the day before and then he got up and he said this at the conference. Oh, I couldn't cancel him then. And he got up, but he was really interesting. And he's very passionate about, uh, about his thing. But we saw a gap in the market. You know, banting is, everybody's talking about banting. A lot of people are eating banting. But everybody loves pizza. And I'm a firm believer that people eat pizza till the end of time, which is one of the reasons why I got into this business, because it's not a fad food. 
everybody will always eat pizza till the end of time, and they'll also eat pasta till the end of time. Um, but we realized that there were some people that were going to stop eating pizza. So we looked to see if we could find a, a banting base. And we started making our own, but it was very difficult to make it consistently in our stores. We found a company that could make one that we felt was, was acceptable, and it's flying. It's absolutely flying. It's just, it's gone crazy. People love it, and I, I mean, just, I see all the tweets and that people like, you know, I haven't been able to eat pizza, and I couldn't eat pizza, and now I can go and eat pizza again. So yeah, it's working really well. well. You're part of the EO organization. Yeah. Tell us a bit about Entrepreneur Organization. Entrepreneur's Organization is, it's an organization of, of entrepreneurs, the criteria being that you have to start the business yourself or be the major shareholder of the business. Um, you can't be a, a hired gun YPO, which is a similar organization, Young Presence organization. You can be the CEO of a company, but not necessarily have started it or be the, have the controlling shareholding. So all these entrepreneurs are there. They're a crazy lot, and they've got these amazing businesses. I think you had Rob Stokes on your show we did. a while ago. In fact, Rob's in my EO forum. Quite okay. a dynamic dude. <laughs> um, crazy dude, yeah. Good guy. Um, you used to uh, use them as a digital... Yeah, we used to use Quirk uh, to help us with our digital. I'll get there in a second. But on, on, with EO, the, pro the predominant thing is you meet, we meet in a forum once a, once a month. Uh, I have a forum of, there's nine of us, all started their own businesses, very diverse, from a, a guy that makes films to a digital marketing agency to a retail clothing guy. Um, just very, very diverse. And, uh, and we talk about issues and challenges. Um, and any of you who own your own businesses, it can be quite lonely when you're at the top um, and you think you've got these problems and then you get into a room with other entrepreneurs and you realize you're not alone, that everybody has the same issues and challenges. Um, and it's actually quite enlightening and, and relieving to know that you're not alone. What failures have you had? Tell us failures. a bit about your failures. Have you had any failures? I've had <laughs> failures. I've had failures. So I think it was our second store, we started franchising. The lady that we used to help us write our operations and procedures manual, um, who used to work for this um, franchising consultant that we used, she's an amazing lady, and she said, listen, she wanted a store. And we said, fine, we'll do a JV with you. Yep. One and only JV we ever did. And we opened up in Bedford View in Johannesburg in a site that was a standalone site, and I think the three restaurants prior to us had all failed there. And we thought, well, no problem, we'll get in there the minute people walk to that door and try our food, our food's outstanding. Our, we'll just convert them all. Um, and we opened the doors and we couldn't get people to walk through the door and try the food. They just wouldn't come in. It was like one of those sites that just people didn't like going to. And we never knew this, never expected it. And in my lease, uh, I had a clause that in the first year we could opt out of the lease with one month notice. Oh wow. And month 11, we just said, that's it. We opted out and we shut shop. Um, took a big hiding financially. Um, but I was, you know, I'm not one to cry with spilt milk. You, know, you fail, you fail. It's, it's okay to fail, let me tell you. And if you're an entrepreneur, it's good to fail. But don't fail at the same thing twice. That's bad. Learn the first time. But it's absolutely okay to fail. It doesn't matter if it doesn't work the first time. You'll try it out, you'll find another way to do it. But if, you don't, if you're too scared to take that leap, You'll never ever know. So failure's not all bad. It's not like school where you failed and you get like clapped with a stick. We used to when I was at school. Um, so that was that was a failure. We've had a couple of stores that went down that that weren't ours. Um, that just pre-recession, uh, okay. a couple opened a store, and a uh, combination of things. But uh, we took the site off plan and. Also, one of those sites that just never took off, recession came, and it never worked after about two years that they closed. And even though it was a franchisee store, it's a failure for us. You never want to see a store in the brand not make it. Mm. I mean, we really go to bat for our franchisees. We'll take their pay and we'll work hard. I've got a store at the moment. We opened it in Pretoria in December. It's one of our express shops. It's a, it's a Mio store. And our Mio stores, we've only got, uh, we're about to open our, I think our fifth one now. There's one in Claremont, there's one in Durbanville, we bought to open one in Meadow Ridge. And it's a small express version of Kokakia. 
but this is the first time we opened in a big mall in a food court and it's tanked it's been a disaster the lsm that's come in there has got a much lower um uh, amount to spend and they're just bypassing our store and they're going to burger king on the left and they're going here and they are just going everywhere except our store plus the center is revamping so there's not as many feet as there were and it's a big problem it's like I mean, it's a, it's a disaster at the moment. And I've just come up with a, a whole new concept that we're going to launch where we're going to make a small pizza. As you know, we only do one size in our store. So now we're going to do a, a large, a regular, and a small, oh. and the little guy, you know, and to compete with other guys that are selling a meal for 25 rand. And we've never done that. And it's, it's, I could fail. It's exciting. And I pitched it to them this morning, in fact. Um, but I'm really excited about it. I'm seeing this as an opportunity. And I want them to work. So I'm prepared to try anything but we're not bastardizing our brand. It's the same quality, but we're just making it small. <laughs> and we're giving people the option, you know, the opportunity to try a brand who could never try it before because a margarita started at 60 bucks, 59 bucks. So, yeah, you've got to do some crazy things. Okay. And your I know there's some things you can't, some numbers you can't explain here, but what's, uh, what is your turnover in one of the divisions? The group, the stores will turn over about 250 million. Uh, in fact, they did now end of Feb. Um, uh, that's across the whole group. And my busiest store, uh, they consistently do seven figures a month. Wow. Um, the busiest turnover on any one day at a Kolkaki pizzeria was 225 grand. In one day? In one store? One store, one day. <laughs> Was it a power failure? No, I'll tell you working? what it was. It was Franchuk and Bastille weekend. Uh, <laughs> and, I think but I might mean, have eaten there that still, time. On the Saturday, it's insane what goes on there. Absolutely insane. Oh, and, they got one, and they got one oven. They're not even a big store with two ovens. They've got one oven. So listen, there. there's a lot of <laughs> beer and, and, and stuff in there as well, but it's a lot of pizza. And people are happy. Maybe they're just because they're pissed. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> We've got some questions. We're going to go to some <laughs> questions now. Um, Sebastian asks you, what technologies does Kolkakia have to save costs on staff management? What we have to save costs on staff management. Yeah. Um, I just mentioned this, uh, this new training technology that we've put in stores. Um, and that'll save money from a point of view of people having to send staff in to go and get trained from around the country. Um, and we can get consistent training everywhere. Um, what other technology from a from a cost saving perspective um, that's probably the most that's the one that comes to mind okay. um, because I, I, I just think it's amazing I think it's going to change the nature of our business completely make yeah. it more fun yeah. um, are any of the items on your menu still the same from back in the early days in the 90s yeah they are I mean there's quite a few pizzas from there because you know we as I said, you guys come in and then you don't ever want to change. <laughs> so then we, it's hard to take pizzas off the menu. Now, menu's grown, and I personally think it's too big, and I fight with my fellow directors because I'd like to reduce the menu now. We've got about 50 pizzas. We change our menu twice a year. Not big changes. We'll have a summer and a winter menu, and we'll take a couple off and put a couple on. But it keeps growing. But we've got probably still at least 20 from those days. Okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah. What is your favorite pizza? Is my it... Is it um, I actually found one on yeah, some research. Is it still the Cedriano? The Cedriano, it's, it's one of them. One of them. I oh. go through phases, but I think my all-time favorite is the Inferno, the Prawns Peri Peri. Inferno. That sounds hot. Oh, it's a good pizza. And the prawns are good. It's a good pizza. Hard to always get good prawns. <laughs> um, but then I also like um, a pizza that, you know, I liked it, so they took it off the menu. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens I find that at home as well I say to my wife I like this and then I never see it again <laughs> and <laughs> I say why are you making that she says no because your daughter Isabella likes it or Mila likes it I said but I like that one she says well Isabella doesn't so we don't make it anymore oh, well. that's what happens Sorry, yeah. but uh, <laughs> the biggest the most popular pizza is the Morituri okay that's uh, that's the most popular pizza consistently what's on a Morituri uh, bacon, chicken, feta, avo, red pepper. Okay, actually, that sounds really good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Eric good. says here, is there a restaurant chain? Oh, wait, that just changed. Is there a restaurant chain? Is there a restaurant chain, local or international, that you admire and aspire to be like? 
great question. Um, I tell you what I like at the moment, and it's not that I want my business to be like that, but I really like it is, if any of you are familiar with the, and I probably am probably pronouncing it the way South Africans pronounce it, but I don't think it's the correct pronunciation, is Chipotle. Chipotle in the States. Chipotle. Chipotle. That's okay. American. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the reason why it's great is we make great restaurant quality food in our store. And not all people do. And a lot of people think that when a, as soon as a, business, a restaurant franchises, no franchises make good food. And I think that's not true, but I think it's true for a lot of them. And Chipotle, I'm just going to say that. I'm not going to try the way you guys said it. Um, they make great quality food. And what they've done is they've, they've done it in a, in a production line. So you get to the counter, and it's bespoke. You'd like, do you want it in a bowl? Do you want it in a burrito? And then you make your food as you go along, and you get to the end, and they cook it up, and they wrap it up for you. Um, and it's good, clean, healthy food. And what they've done is they've made, they call it quick service restaurants, a fast casual, where you get great, good restaurant quality food without the full sit-down experience. You can sit and eat it, but you've paid at the counter beforehand. And that's where all the growth is happening in the States, and you're going to see it's going to start filtering to the rest of the world. Fast casual, pay at the counter, get your food, and they'll bring it to you on a plate if you want to eat it, or you can take it away. You can leave as soon as you've finished. You don't have to wait for a waiter to bring your bill. You don't have to pay a service fee or a tip because there's no way to servicing you. Um, and that's definitely the way forward. But it's, got to, it's not fast food. It's got to be superior quality food. And, uh, and I think it's a fantastic model. And everybody in the States is fighting out to try and do it with pizza now. And there's a few that have got like 20, 30 stores. In fact, Chipotle's even opened a pizza brand called uh, Le Cale, Le Cale. Okay. Um, but no one's really owned it, and I think that's, that's what they're trying to so do. So you're thinking of getting in there? I'd like to do that. I'd like yeah. to see my Mio stores where you come in and always sell it as a margarita, and then you just come in and you make your own. I mean, and Ditcho 24 is doing it in Joburg, but I, I still don't think they're hitting. Yeah. I think they're good, but I don't think they're hitting the market, the market quite the way I would do it. I want it to be my quality, but you come make your own. Are there any questions out there? Do we have any questions? Okay, here we go. Um, good question, thank you. So I mentioned to you that I, that I spoke to, to consultants, but then what I did is I had to take my store and I had to put all these systems in place, get a food cost for my pizza, make sure that I had systems in place that everybody could do. And I did that myself. I sat in my house and I worked during the day at home, then at the restaurant, I'd go to the restaurant at night. Um, and I literally built the business so one little step at a time. Um, but I did have people that I could go and speak to. I started off with an office with just me and a desk for the PA I was going to hire one day, uh, <laughs> literally. And then we hired a field service consultant and we, and we, we grew like that. Um, but I had people that I could go and speak to, um, and I sought out people, and I read a lot. Um, if I've got a challenge with something, I'll read it. If someone says it's a great book on marketing, um, go and read it. I'll read it. If it's a book on franchising, I'll read it. Book on restaurants, um, and pick up the phone and phone somebody and just say, listen, what about this? Um, and that's been a great help. And, and today, if anybody wants to come and talk to me about franchising or business, whatever, I always make time for them because pe people made time for me. And I'm not that I've got the best advice for people, but what little I've got, I'm always happy to share. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, no. Push the button. Doesn't matter, just talk. Okay, I'll try. Yeah, it's fine. And I agree with you that uh, banks are the worst places to go to if you're trying to raise capital to start a business. But um, do you see enough credible franchisees or potential franchisees out there that can't get into the business because they don't have enough capital? And then, linked to that, would you not say your requirement of 50% unencumbered capital is 
very much banking mentality too. I know it's for your own protection, but it's like a lose-lose for a potential entrepreneur because now franchising looks like it's something for people that are already in the money. So two questions there. The first question um, is do we lose good people because they don't have the funding? Absolutely, we do. And when we do find someone that we think is going to be good, um, I'll bank them. Uh, bad choice of words, but I'll bank them. Uh, <laughs> So what I'll do is if I do find somebody, because we only open owner-operated stores, we won't allow somebody with cash to come in, uh, take a store and put in a manager. It's got to be an owner-operated business for a whole host of reasons. But uh, you know, when your manager disappears, the guys put the money up, isn't going to come running down and start flipping pizzas. So, and you've got to have some skin in the game. Otherwise, with this business is too tough. So if I do have somebody who's got money and wants to invest, I will try and marry them with that great uh, applicant who's gone through the, the process and qualified. Um, but to get through the process, what I find with some people, if they don't have the funds, they will then walk away. And there's many franchise, uh, franchises out there. You don't have to come and get a Kolkaki pizzeria at 4 million bucks. There's a franchise out there for 300,000 rand. You know, it's a, it's, it, you know, if you're looking for a business, if you're absolutely passionate about the food, like I get with some people, they'll go through the testing phase just to see if they qualify, and then see whether I can marry them with somebody. The second question was um, about the 50%. So I don't do that for me, I do that for you. Because the worst thing is to start a business and you've got this massive debt that you've got to service every month that you can't afford to live. Now you're working to, to service this debt. So what we've realized now is if we minimize that to some degree, then, because th there's no guarantee how your business is going to take off. You know, you hope it's going to take off like a racehorse, and a lot of them do. But then some start like that, some are like that, some are like that, some are even like that. Like this one in Pretoria. And that operator in Pretoria is brilliant. She's got two full sit-down Kokaki stores that do telephone numbers. So it's not the operator, you know, but it didn't work out right. So. We want to put you in a position where if your business, and we take a conservative approach on, on how the business is going to take off, that you can still take home money and earn a living out of your business while you're paying it off. So it's not about me. It's more about you. Otherwise, you, you just won't make it. Are you and thinking of expanding forward. into Africa or in overseas? We are looking. We get calls from people all the time, open here, open there, all over the place. We currently hoping to do a deal with Namibia now and to open in Vintuk. Yeah. And we are looking at the UAE um, Interesting. to see whether we can uh, hook up with a master franchisee there. But I like Southern Africa. Is that because you're following the Ocean Baskets brand? That's your no, no, no. Um, they are all there we just because we get a lot of inquiries from there. Okay. And, ah. um, and, and people want to see us there. And I think it would do well. Um, but it's not easy. I was chatting to Robbie Brosen from Nando's and he just said to me, he said, You've got to realize when you go there, you've got to service these guys. How are you going to service them? People think well, it's easy, just go overseas. It's not easy. It's not even easy just to go to another city where you're not, where you haven't been. You know, your first time to Durban, and they've all got to train in Joburg or Cape Town. You can't send all the staff up there to train. So it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge to, to open that first store in a, in a new area. Um, but we, we are looking to expand. Do you still spend time on the floor with customers? If not, do you miss it? I don't spend time on the floor with customers anymore, and I do miss it. Um, I was good at it, and I loved it, and it was great. And my career has changed. I'm no longer a restauranteur. I'm a franchisor, and I run an administrative business. Um, and when I had that epiphany that day, it was epiphany about being a restauranteur, not being a franchisor. Um, and I, I miss it, but I do love what I do, and it's great. I mean, I see my brand grow, and I see stores open up. Um, it, cool it gives me a lot of joy but it's it's nice to work the floor it's, it's just be a i'm a waiter that's that's, that's what i just want to be a waiter <laughs> and i'm good at it <laughs> thank you very much for your time michael i really appreciate My it pleasure. um we've got the t um, twitter ladies are you ready while the twitter competition is taking place can we have the fishbowl pass around so that the last people can hand in their business cards wherever that is there it is in front um so that's going to happen. And then, the, well, that's just put your pops in there. You can win a thousand rand Kokacha voucher. And for the Twitter competition, Adelaide, you have the floor. First off, thanks so much, guys. We actually ranked number eight today in South Africa.
Okay. Um, we sort of had to give Miss SA her day at number seven, so. Oh, <laughs> um, so there were lots of great tweets tonight. Um, Note the one I'm about to read is not the winner, but I think it's a really amazing tweet from Megan egg sa at Egg Sandwich 11. <laughs> Get the avo, appreciate the customers, spend your time and be involved. There's no plan B. So it's really, you know, sort of been captured really quite well. But the winner tonight um, said, step one, have an epiphany. Step two, believe it'll work. Step three, take action. Step four, keep it current. And lastly, learn from your mistakes. Tracy from Made of Metal, where are you? Tracy, come forward. There we go. You can, you can give that oh, to there we go. Tracy. There we go. Thank you. You've just won a thousand rand. There we go. At any of your yeah, stores. Don't, don't even share it. Just eat it all yourself. And I think Tracy's just found a lot more friends suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now for the business card draw. Um, is the fishbowl finished? Where's the fishbowl? There it is. Simon, come forth. There we go. Thank I you I'm just going to tell you a quick story. So I, my kids go to, go to school and I give my school a meal, v a, a voucher, 100 buck voucher for the junior prep, the senior prep and the high school every single week of the term for the year and I've been doing it for about the last five years. That's a lot of money and a lot of vouchers. They gave it to my daughter the other day. It's like re-gifting a gift to the person who's given it to you. They couldn't even go out and get her a voucher from somewhere else. It was like shocking. It's <laughs> a funny story. It's bad. It's <laughs> really good. Okay, Mrs. God, so please choose something over here for uh, okay. the winner. Let's get in there. There we go. Aha. I saw this person tweeting, actually. That's a banker, so I can't give him this. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Darian Leprini from Avanza. There, oh, we, there go. we go. You can give us over to him. Excellent. Well done. Thanks very much. There we go. Enjoy. Thank you very much. It's a happy guy. Okay, Fiona. Where's Fiona? There you are. Um, your prize. So Fiona is giving away. What are you giving away? Come, Fiona. Come tell us. All right. Um, I'm running communication workshops in April. Uh, one of I, my biggest issues has been with people who work for companies, can't speak, can't write, and can't tweet. So in an effort to make a difference to the world, we're running communication workshops for graduates and young people who'd like to, for business and pleasure, whether you're getting the girl or you're getting the deal, Right, you need to be able to pitch. So yeah, I've got two tickets for my workshops. And are you gonna be drawing cards for that? Yes, I'm drawing a card. Do you wanna draw one card for two people or two different cards? Um, Should I get these out? Two cards. I think two separate ones. Okay, yeah. there we go. One. And another one. There we go, so you guys can come speak to Fiona. Um, and also, she's moving from corporate life to her own startup on Wednesday. So yes. good luck with that one. First of April, start of a life. Oh, this was a blank. Okay, that was a blank. Oh, that's a blank. Okay. Sure. Draw another one. Here we go. And it is none other. The first one is Priscilla Macy. Priscilla Macy. Is she even here? Maybe she, I saw some the two ladies over there were left earlier. Yes, it was Priscilla because I met her earlier. In the okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have to be unfortunate. I think she left. Anyway, let's, let's do that again. Sure. Yeah, Sorry, do. Priscilla. Okay. Okay, so Malcolm Gray, Gray Tech. Gray Tech. There we go. Well okay. done. Excellent. Good one. Thank you. Well done. Well done. You can speak to her. There we this go. Is a, <laughs> and this is a, a great card. Yeah. Fort Hartley. Jay Clark. Jay Clark. There we go. Well done. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. So you, the two of you must please come speak to Fiona. Fiona, you must get hold yeah, of them. Yeah. Come to there me. we go. Hold well on. Congratulations. Yeah, Excellent. Can I just tell you, the workshop has been so well written. I could choose a winner for the three of the actual chosen pros. But the three are amazing. <laughs> what did she say? <laughs> what did she say? <laughs> what did she say? I don't know. She every single time. No, she does. Really. It's a gift. <laughs> thank you, Fiona. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. And Michael, thank you for your time.
Thank you. Really appreciate it for your insights. Thank you all. Okay, your lanyards, there's a stand outside that you got them on. Please put them back onto that stand. Um, we will be drawing a card from that stand with a lanyard name, and the person gets to win some entrepreneurship books and insights from Pierre. So please put your name bags on there. And also, to you, I have to get down here somewhere. There it is. Go get to this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Book and a sort of Not a voucher to my store. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Not much. Not a voucher. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.